Hello and welcome to PMI's Leading for Business Excellence podcast. I'm Susanna Clark, Managing Partner of PMI, the performance improvement, consulting, training and apprenticeship firm. This podcast brings inspiring stories from across the globe and a multitude of different sectors. I talk to great leaders who share their experience and what business excellence means to them. In this episode, I am joined by Paul Hayward, Continuous Improvement Lead for Cooper Vision, who are one of the largest contact lens manufacturers in the world. I am frequently asked, how do we achieve a culture of continuous improvement? And that's what this episode is all about. Faced with an operating target that their production system was struggling to achieve, Cooper Vision had to decide what to do. Do they buy more equipment? Do they hire more people? These choices we've all considered in the face of similar challenges. So this conversation is all about how Cooper Vision chose continuous improvement to overcome their quality and reliability challenges, how they went about it, and what amazing results they have achieved. It's an inspiring story of how a culture of continuous improvement can create a real shift change in performance. I do hope you enjoy it. Today, I'm delighted to have Paul Hayward with me in our Leading for Business Excellence podcast. Thank you very much for joining me today, Paul. It's lovely to have you here. Paul, I wondered if we could just start off with you giving a brief introduction, who you are, who you work for, what you do, etc. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Hayward. Um, I work for a company called Cooper Vision, and we're the second largest contact lens manufacturer in the world. And I am their continuous improvement lead. Great. Thank you. There's some, um, we were talking um, earlier, but there are some very interesting uh, challenges that Cooper Vision have to deal with. And uh, that relates to volume of orders versus batch size. Um, which I think yeah. our listeners would be really intrigued to hear. I know my chin dropped when you first told me. I mean, one one of our departments is uh, our made to order department, and we make twelve million batches a month uh, with a batch size of one. Every single one's different. It it's a, it's a challenge, yeah. Yes, indeed, and I know that's one of the areas that you've looked at and worked on in the improvement. So I'm looking yeah. forward to getting into that because that's phenomenal numbers. Um, absolutely incredible. Yeah, it, you said to other people and the numbers just blur into just, they're too big to comprehend. They're just big. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so um, the reason for um, us talking today was because Cooper Vision were successful at the BQF Awards recently for the Excellence in CI Culture Award. Um, so that was a fantastic, obviously, fantastic result for you and, you know, very, very well done. Um, I wondered if you could just tell us a bit about what has winning that award meant to Cooper Vision and to you and your team? Uh, to, to me, it's purely recognition for the people that have actually done the work. To cut out the bag, I haven't really done the work. <laughs> I just enabled. I just enabled lots of other people to do lots of other things. I, I could never have done what they've done because I don't know the process as well as they do. But equally, there was hundreds of them, and only one of me. So for me, it's it's outside recognition from an internationally recognised group that says, "Do you know what?" Not only have you done a good job, you've done an outstanding job, better or as good as anybody else anywhere. And it's a recognition to, to those people from the production floor that have they've gone with me, they've followed the, the, the program and they've followed me in, in this journey. And now they've been told from someone else that we've been doing a great job. People within the company will always pat you on the back. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. It's brilliant. And you think, really, are you saying that? Is that? But the the BQF has got no vested interest in telling us that we're doing a great job when we're not doing a great job. Yes. But for them to come back and say, actually, yeah, that's that's phenomenal. 
It is, and it's a fantastic achievement. I know there were a lot of entries, so um, you know, very, very well done, both to you and yeah. and the entire team. Wonderful. So yeah. I'd like to start off because I, you know, I want to explore yeah. the sort of work that you've been doing in Cooper Vision to achieve the results you've been achieving. But I think it'd be really interesting because this question of can you tell me how you, um, uh, you know, instill a culture of continuous improvement is one of the questions I'm asked all the time by clients. Yeah. It's that holy grail. It's what they're looking for. Um, I don't know that, know that they always know what it means. So I'd first like to start with what does it mean to you in terms of what does a CI culture mean? I think I, think I, I sussed that we'd cracked the CI culture when I got pulled off to do another project and I came back three months later and it had progressed. Right. And I'd done nothing. The team and the teams across 24 hours, seven days a week shift patterns had all just carried on doing it. Yeah. Because it wasn't me pushing it. It was that they, they've actually seen a value in that. And us doing this makes our life easier, so it's easier for us to do this than it is to work the way we always used to work. And then when I came back, it was like, yeah, we've we've got that critical mass, whatever you want to call it, where we've got to the level now where it self sustains. Um, it was always it's imp- it was empowered from the top. The management said, "Yep, yeah, let's go for it." But the momentum and the the engagement has come from the bottom up, um, and there's 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 always an equation that people talk about e equals q times a. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. If the people don't accept it, then it's never going to happen. Yes. But because we engaged people, and you got their engagement, we sort of eliminated the acceptance because we were getting people to come up with ideas for themselves yeah to fix their problems by themselves so it was their idea why would they not be engaged yes. and then yes. then i've only got to think about well is it a good idea or not and there were ideas that we accept we took forward we progressed and there were also ideas that we said you know what yeah we can't we can't really do that and but we made a point of saying look if you come up with an idea that we can't do that's not a bad thing. Come up with another one. Yes. It, you know, it, it's, yeah, so we didn't make that as a, a point where you keep coming up with ideas that we can't do. That's that's not good. No, it's just we found out something else that we can't do. So delete all, tick all them off and you're only left with what you can do. Yes, yes, indeed. So how long ago did you start on this? I'm going to use that word journey. But- yeah, <laughs> yeah. Journey, crusade, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, I'm going to say three years ago. Okay. And I think that's important for people to understand is it, it takes a while, doesn't it? It's not, a, you know, there's no magic yeah. wand. It's not no. an overnight transformation. No. It is, it is continuing to work at it. It's a long uphill, I'm not going to say battle, but it's a long uphill journey. Mm-hmm. And yes, it, it's not an overnight thing. But the second you hit that turning, tipping point, yeah, it's it's like someone's turned all the lights on. It's like, oh, what happened there? Yeah, and everything. But until you hit that, you do. It does. It is a long, and it takes a lot of equipment, and it's all about people at the end of the day. It, it's you've got to get that engagement, and you've got to get those people, and the the only way to get the engagement from people when you're working 24 7 is yes you do have to be here at two o'clock in the morning mm. you do have to come in at four in the morning and because that's when the people are here that are doing the job so yes yeah it takes some commitment and you mentioned that you had it came from the top you know you had that yeah. engagement from the leadership so it'd be really interesting to sort of explore a bit more about how did you go about doing that with the leadership team? And then what were the steps that you took to cascade it down to the, the very bottom of the organization and the people yeah. actually doing the work? So we, we, we put, I put a proposal together. Uh, initially, the reason behind implementing our Project Trident was the fact that um, our make-to-order department 
uh, we had more orders than we could fulfill. Okay. Um, so the longer we were we were running, the further behind we were dropping. Um, our lead time from you clicking on the internet to order your contact lenses to Mrs. Jones getting her contact lenses, our target was 15 days and we were in breach of that nearly a lot of the time. Right. So it had become a global concern for the company. We'd installed a second production line at some considerable cost. We still couldn't keep up with production. Gosh, okay. So it was, you know, management, senior management needed something that could give a tangible result, but now Mm -hmm. not, you know, in two years' time when we bought a third production line. And then when you looked at the the quality and the OEE and the reliability, it was like, we could probably, if we can get one running really, really well, we could probably cope with one and a bit. We don't need the full two production lines. Yes. So we we sort of um, demonstrated to them about lean and working leaner and in, not working harder but working smarter mm-hmm. and the benefits from some silly exercises and games. Uh, and then it was, okay, yeah, I, I'm lucky. I did have them. There was a point where they were up against a wall. They need this but they can't find a way of getting it. So I said, look, we're going to bring in the Mac problem solving. We're going to bring in lean manufacturing and we're going to bring in ideas management, Not, but not at, at, at an engineering level. We're going to bring it in at a production operator level, right at the Gemba, right at, at, at the, the front line, should we say. Yes. Um, so we're not trying to solve complicated engineering problems that take capital investment and validation and commissioning. And this is just, why are you walking five miles a day? I don't know. <laughs> well, we can. you only have to walk one, do I? And that simple, simple, hundreds and hundreds of simple improvements has made a massive difference. And so you're back to your one and a bit production lines now? No, no, we're still running both production lines. Okay. But... If you click on on the internet and Stephen, whatever, orders his contact lenses, he now waits two days. Goodness. So you've gone from a target of 15 that you couldn't reliably achieve, achieve to an absolute reliable two-day. Yeah, we're down, we're down to two days. You know, occasionally, it might go up to two and a half to three, and that comes back again. But, um, yeah, we're consistently running well under what our target is wow amazing and obviously yeah. no cost of, of introducing a third production line because you know you right no, to say the to. risk is that people or organizations start saying okay well, we need we need more equipment and then when we have more equipment obviously that's cost then we need more people to run that equipment so that's additional more cost and and naturally your margins start to then hit yeah then because you are you are investing in the wrong thing you're investing in yeah. the equipment as opposed to investing in the process yeah. that, that you're working does the harder work. yes yeah yeah I mean, we we've um we've always done domain problem solving within cooper vision but we've always done it at an engineering level or quality engineers but we took it down to production operators um and it was okay right what do you find really annoying mm-hmm. like this i've had enough of this by the end of the day right can we do it? Well, I can't do anything about it because that's the way we do it. See? And then change it. But the belief was that, that it in the, the belief was that we couldn't change it. Yes, it was the um, we've always done it that way. We yeah, we're regulated, so we we have work instructions and procedures, uh, things that we have to do. But we'd spent years turning people's minds off saying no you don't do that do this don't do that do this and so actually i want to turn you i want to turn your brain back on and say if that's hard there must be an easier way and it's 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 like eating a banana (laughs) most people grab the top of the banana and try and rip it off and they squash the top of the banana and it's like but it's the way we've always done it. Yes. But if you turn it upside down and pinch the bottom, it just peels. 
Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> you heard it first, listeners. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but it, if if you watch the David Attenborough programs, monkeys always eat bananas from the other end. They just pinch it and it pulls apart. But we're too busy trying to say no, we're not monkeys. Yeah. They said, yeah, but that's the easier way. So let's do it in an easier way. So, I mean, you yeah. talk about you know you were you're heavily regulated. So how yeah, did are. you how did you sort of manage that balance between wanting to redesign the way the work is being done, but managing to can you know still adhere to the required regulations? So we've got there are some requirements that we we have to adhere to. We cannot change them. Hmm. Sterilization. Uh, the the parts of our process that are safety orientated towards our customer. Mm -hmm. But equally, we tell the FDA what our process is. So we told them what we do and well, why can't we change it? Yeah. And the belief was, well, once once you've told them what you can do, you can't change it. I said, well, surely and or it's just paperwork. Mm. But there are there are there are steps especially in sterilization and safety and uh, traceability, that sacrament, you, you have to have that. Yes. But the, the fact that we have a process that means someone has to go and get blisters from a fridge or solution from a fridge that's uh, 200 yards away, okay, well, let's put another fridge up here. Mm. Oh, well, we told them it's in that fridge. <laughs> okay, well, let's just tell them we've got a second fridge. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is all seems so simple and common sense, doesn't it? You know, yeah. when you talk about it like this. But we, we're indoctrinated. You, you must follow the procedure. You know, and, yes, we must follow the procedure. And if we, But if we want to make a change, we can, but we have to do it in the right way. Mm. Otherwise, we're obviously, we're in breach of our regula regulatory mm. style. Mm. But as long as we... We can question it, we can justify it, and we back it with data. Hmm. As long as we do the process properly, we can change the way we work. And some of our improvements didn't even require us to change anything with regulatory. It was, why do we do that? I, I don't know, it's bonkers. Okay, let's let's change it. And so in terms of, I mean, it sounds like, you know, you, you did some great work by going to Gemba and talking to the people who were doing the work. And then what did you do in terms of, because it's more than just a chat, isn't it? You need to have more than yeah. just a chat for them to learn how you're thinking and for them to be able to think in a similar way. Yeah. So how did you manage that with the people? What sort of development did you do? We, we, um, we did a survey of our, of our staff and we looked at, we asked them 10 questions uh, and we looked at engagement and knowledge and understanding we highlighted the, the our three top shortfalls that we had. Um, one of them was we never finish what we start. We don't listen to the the, the production staff, um, and people don't feel valued. Gosh, so okay. that was a, a, a bit of a punch in the gut, but yeah, it was honest. And it's better to know, better to know, isn't that? Yeah, yeah. Imagine it's all so. Okay. We then, yeah, we then put together a training pack. Um, to level the playing field, um, we took, um, we created programs on, or training programs on data driven decision making, why we use, why we need to use data, mm -hmm. what happens if we don't use data, we, and go with your gut feel. Um, linked with that, we had uh, leading in a lean environment. So, in coaching your team to work and think as if they were you, rather than the team leader taking control and it's going to attract followers and minions and tell, has to tell everyone what to do. It's like, actually, the team leader needs to give the control to the team. So the team leader themselves leads the team, but if there's a problem, the team can think of all the questions that the team leader would have thought of anyway right. and goes to the team leader and says, I'm going to do this because of this. Mm -hmm. And the team leader then only has to say yes or no, rather than analyze stacks and stacks of data 
and then go and find that person again and say, yes, do that. But by the time they've done that, it's too late. Yes. The circumstances in production have changed. The answer you're going to give is probably going to be the wrong answer. So we did that. Um, we also brought in, um, we, I put together a, a principles of lean manufacturing that covered push, pull, Kanban, work instructions, one piece flow, all sorts of things um, under the guise of making paper aeroplanes. Really? So we went in the boardroom. We probably made, in groups of 10, we probably made 500 paper airplanes between us. Um, and one particular day, our CEO put his head through the door, <laughs> saw a literal carnage of paper airplanes, uh, looked at me and went, okay then, <laughs> and left. And it was like, cool. <laughs> but it, we, I did, when we did it, we didn't tell them what we were trying to get them to understand or what we were trying to teach them. We just said, right, we're going to make planes. We're going to have some fun. But, and then at the end, we said, ah, we've actually made five times the amount of planes with better quality, with half the amount of people. We looked at um, when they, they throw the planes, where they were landing on the floor. So we looked, we covered distribution. And it's like, so the, the better the quality of planes went, actually, they all started to land in a smaller area. Right. And you could almost do the bow curve. Yes. And it's like, there you go. That's that's real life. This is all of you guys chucking your paper airplanes, but it still fitted the bow curve. Good. And it's like, oh. And then right at the end, we sort of say, look, we rearranged the paper plane production line and we can't we can't move machinery at work. It's too big. It's the size of your house. Good. But what we can do is think about what we do. And then I challenged them to load 10 envelopes with 10 bits of paper by folding it into three, but doing it in batch production. Uh, and then I said, right, okay, how, how can we do that quicker? And we go, oh, if I prep all the envelopes, if I've marked all the paper where I can fold it. I said, brilliant. But this time, do one piece of paper, put it in an envelope, seal it, sign it, then do the next one. And we got comments that, oh, that was hard. That was, I said, well, actually, it's 25% quicker. Goodness. The first time you did it, you took four minutes, 30 seconds. This time, you've taken three minutes, 25. And we had comments of disbelief. It was like, oh, well, that can't be right. You've cheated. So I didn't <laughs> cheat. You did it. So, and it was to, to think that, you know, this is just 10 envelopes. Good. But over the course of a 12 hour night shift, thinking about what you do can mean that you go home at the end of a 12 hour night shift and you don't want to shout and scream at everyone because you're so tired. Mm -hmm. You've actually got energy to stay up and say goodbye to the kids when they go to school. Yes. Um, or you can slow down at work and still do the same amount of work, but with better quality. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a, a real eye opener to some people that is actually the work that we are doing or the work that we have to do is actually stopping us doing the job that we're doing. And that was the case when we did some process maps and sp some spaghetti diagrams that, you know, your job is here, but why do you have to keep walking to, well, okay, well, let's move that over to you. Because so that action was actually stop meaning that you're not at your place of your job. So it's stopping you doing your job. Yes, yes. And although the paper planes, you know, I mean, it's it's a game, isn't it? Um, but, yeah. but I can imagine that it also not only did your CEO not necessarily expect that he was going to walk into a room and see that sort of carnage, but but they probably didn't either. And it's about sort of no. almost um, not unbalancing people, but um, not necessarily giving them the norm, giving them something different no. to do, change their thinking and yeah. approach. Well, yeah, I mean, too many times you go into a training. Oh, you've got two and a half hours of lean manufacturing training. <laughs> I'll fall asleep. But really? No, actually, you're going to run around like a loon. You're going to throw paper airplanes. And I, I was wearing a high vis and a face mask because <laughs> I did get hit in the face. Um, you know, we had lots of fun. And we, we had, um, uh, we set up a production line at one point. And if you wanted the rover, 
you had to ring a bicycle bell, which is great. But when there's eight bicycle bells, they all sound the same. <laughs> and then we have one of the managers in the room next door said, I can keep hearing bicycle bells. And you're just going, yeah, that that, that was us. That was. <laughs> but it, it was fun. It, it was um, light, very lighthearted. But it was completely different to any other training. Um, at, and yeah, lean manufacturing, if you're a production operator, is probably one of the most boring subjects in the world. But we did make it a lot of fun and we did have a laugh. Yeah. And and yeah. and did you find that you needed to have more than one sort of training session with people, or did you find that that was the thing that unleashed the 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 opportunities, if you like, for people to think differently just by through that one exercise? Um, no, well, we 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 had a we did the the lean paper plane mm. exercises. We did a, a pros- bit on process. Um, we looked at some real life examples of where they they've um, made done these improvements to speed up like food agencies getting meals out to people and and actually making a, a real difference to the quality of people's lives and you and you sort of say right well, everything you did the other day in, in the paper plane is is what they've done here you know we made you know we took six minutes with. 10 people and we didn't get a paper plane to the end of our production line <laughs> and then with four people it took 40 seconds you know the the food agency was taking 12 minutes to two minutes it's like it makes a massive difference to what you do yes yes and that liberation of the brain isn't it the, the yeah. brain to um you know, for those discretionary efforts and, and idea generation, as you talked about. So creating an environment where you can start to not be focused on the tedium necessarily of, of, of what you're yeah. doing um, and can be focused on the opportunities for, for new things and to do things in, yeah. in a better way. So we, I mean, as I said, we're heavily regulated. We've got process procedures. We've got work instructions and, and standard ways of working. Yeah. But it is getting pe- the, the, to re- people to realise that that SOP is just, this is the current, this is our best practice currently. But if you can think of a better one, let's change it. It doesn't have to be forever, does it? No. I mean, some of our, our CI ideas that people generated, you know, one I can think of off the top of my head, it saved about £60,000 a year. I oh. Um, yes, he actually. The outcome was I've read the SOP and I actually took time to understand it. Yeah, we don't need to do this, but we oh, but we've always done it. Yeah. Yes, but the work instruction doesn't tell us to do that. Mm. And when you talk to QA, they go, "No, you don't have to." We we always thought, "Why why were you doing that?" It's a bit strange. <laughs> okay, let's stop. <laughs> So, so creating a questioning environment is, yeah. is, is like curiosity, isn't it? It's about generating yeah. that to ask those questions. Yeah. You mentioned your um, engagement survey. Am I right in saying you, you did a second survey later did, on to see what We changed? did do a second survey later on. Um, I would love to say we were 100% on everything, but we live in the real world. We weren't. But our three worst... Um, actions so we know the the not listening to people we don't finish what we start we went from fours and fives out of 10 to 9.5 on all three Uh, yes we did focus on those because they were the points that 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 was the voice of the people so we did focus on those um the first time we put the survey out less than 50 percent of them came back which sort of tells you something in the first place. Yes. The second time we put the survey out, 100% of the surveys came back um, and everyone had filled them in. Brilliant. Yeah. So, you, you know, there are, there, are, there are two parts to this, aren't there? There's, I feel like it's like listening to the people, that's your yeah. in, surveying, and then listening to the work. And that's the going yeah. out together and talking to the people about the work that they do. Yeah. And, and, and understanding... Mm. But li- listening to the people, just 
people, you know, it's all people don't come to work to do bad stuff. People yeah. don't come to work to be a pain. People don't come to work to not understand things because no one likes to feel that I don't get this. Everyone, uh, so it was that. You know, you've got to respect that everyone's different, and and I might be able to explain something to this group of people in one way, but it might not make sense to them. So I've now got to find what makes sense to them, telling them the same news and the same story, but I've got to put it in a way that they can understand. Yes. There's no point me trying to get them to understand my thinking because that's going to take five times longer. I, I need to put it in a language that they can work out. And um, how did you get into all of this in the first place? You know, what, what's your background with regards to improvement? Because, you know, you're clearly... You've got some really strong thoughts and some strong ideas, yeah. and 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 I can see you know how you translate that to work with people and get their engagement. So, who got your engagement? Where did it begin for you? My my, but I'm 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 quite profoundly dyslexic, mm-hmm. and school was horrendous um, until the point. It was like, actually just tell people, just get it out there. It's just, it, it, you know, a lot of people hide it. A lot of people are embarrassed about it. I've got to the point where I'm old, I'm miserable. I look, I can't spell. If, if you, if you want to get upset about it and it makes you feel good to put red pen all over emails and send them back to me, fantastic. As long as it makes you feel good because it does, it makes no difference to me. I know I can't spell. But I've struggled. Um, I've got kids, and I would hate them to struggle the same. Um, so I don't like watching people work hard in, when there's clearly an, an, an easier mm-hmm. way. Um, I lucked in to a green belt work Cooper Vision. There was a, a someone was going to go on the training. They had to counsel, so they sent me on it. And then it was like an epiphany. It was like. Yeah, but why wouldn't you do it this way? <laughs> uh, and it, it it dropped. So then I progressed. I'm on. I'm now black belt. I'm doing my master black belt at the moment. But for me, it's great that I'm a black belt. But I get more of a buzz about having fifty white belts mm. that I've taught. And and that second that you see that little light go on, and they, they go, "Oh, really? <laughs> Is it that simple?" And you go, "Yes." And it's like cracking, brilliant. Go on. I mean, as I said, I said at the beginning that I, you know, I haven't done the work, but we've got fifty white bouts in one department that have some that have made health and safety better, some that have improved regulatory and compliance. Fantastic, really, really important stuff. And the company have to do it. They're, we're not. That's only ever going to cost us money. But some of these that don't cost anything. Mm. And we've got white bouts that have done cost savings that are in six and seven figures. Which is extraordinary. This is for an, in, yes. an in-house white bout course that cost nothing. Mm. But we, I, we, I would never have come up with those ideas. The engineers would never come up with those ideas because we don't live at the Gemba. We don't live that process 24-7, 12 hours a day the operators are the only ones that know that process in that day-to-day detail. Mm. And some of them, it's just like, well, you know, you've you've come up with a wipeout that saved a f- phenomenal amount of money. What made you come up with that? Oh, it was winding me up. I'd had enough. <laughs> yes. And you go, oh, okay. Well, feel free to get wound up again. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> I, I, I often say to people, you know, yeah. when you go down, when you go home at night, or if you go to the pub with your friends, what are the things you're saying about your work that drives you nuts? Because that's yeah. a good place to start with what are yeah. the problems you need to solve. Um, yeah. Very rarely, you know, when, the, when 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 things are winding people up, they stick with them, don't right. they? And they permeate. In, and, and then the absolute opposite is true because you get and people who are infused about making improvements and then you can't stop them talking about the wonderful improvements they've made. Yeah. 
But we, I mean, we, we put a, um, we call it the Trident Wall. Mm-hmm. We've put a, a wall up and all of the white bouts have got an A3 and they're, they're all, their stories are on, are, are on the wall. Anyone that's come up with a CI idea, that's on the wall. We've purely stolen the, the thermometer from the Blue Peter <laughs> thing. So that's how we've tracked our improvements. Uh, the wall is massive yeah. now. But every time we get visitors to site, if they're coming back, they want to see the Trident Wall. <laughs> Fantastic. But the the only names on that wall are the people that have done a project or come up with a CI idea. There's no manager's names on there. My name's not on there. Yeah. Their, their names are on there. There's some pictures of them playing, throwing planes or doing workshops. But there's there's no management or, or myself or leadership. It's all just the teams. Yeah. And when we went to the BQF Awards, we it, it was open. It was a, an amazing night. It was a, a massive achievement. But it was, okay, there's a hat. If you want to go, stick your name in it. Yeah. Uh, we've got 12 seats and we just pulled names out of hat. Okay. We went with a couple of night shift operators, some training um, ladies. We went with some technical operators, a uh, team leader. It was fantastic because mm. it was just brilliant. It was the first time that they'd ever been to anything like that. Mm. And they, they were representing the company. Mm. But I was like, well, you've done the work. Yes. So... I'd love to have taken 160 people, but I couldn't. <laughs> we we got the budget for 12, mm. so we took 12 people. Mm. I, I I must come one day and yeah. see your Trident Wall. I think uh, I, I feel very envious of that. I'm, I think it's a wonderful celebration for you all and and a daily reminder yeah. of, of yeah of yeah what you're um, all doing. You can't you can't go into that department without walking past it. Mm. We've got um, wall decals of, of a Trident. Uh, and some say uh, the Trident program. Some are just a Trident. Some are just the three prongs. But the prongs always point you to the Trident board, mm. no matter where you are. Um, we're split over two different buildings. So each building has got an identical wall. So if, you walk in, if you're working in one building, the Trident wall's there. And if you're working in the other building, the same you've got the same thing. Mm. So it's not in one place, but yeah, it's it's magic. I, lo- I I'm a t- total sad anorak. I love it. <laughs> when we were talking before, you mentioned that um, there have been for, uh, health and safety was an example where yeah. you you, know, you talked about um, improvements happening there. Now, sometimes I know that you've seen things such as the number of near misses reported have gone up. Yeah. And 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 have you had any pushback on any of those sorts of things where people are saying, "Oh, well, we're only expecting things to get worse." No, I, I mean I take a near miss report as a good thing. Mm-hmm. So someone's gone, "Oh, look, that that doesn't look very good. We fill in a near miss, we get it fixed. Someone hasn't hurt themselves." Yeah, we have seen near misses go up, but we've seen accidents come down. Yes, near misses. Accidents have come down, but near misses have gone up greater than the accidents have come down. So I think, you know, you could say that we were lucky before, yeah. but if there's something wrong, it's getting fixed. And and, and people are being honest about there's something wrong, yeah. which is yeah. a shift. But it's not, the near miss isn't a negative mm. thing. Um, and sometimes people say, oh, we're getting too many near misses. I want near misses because mm. near misses means that someone hasn't hurt themselves. Yes. Um, if you see someone doing something dangerous, okay, that's that's something different. Mm-hmm. They're just lucky they haven't hurt themselves. Mm. But when you see something that's not right and you get it put right, then then I think that's a good thing. Yes. But we've seen lead time come down, uh, non-conformity reports or NCRs they've come down regulatory compliance um, and our cost per unit has dropped. So we had a, a target, initial target to reach by the end of year one. Mm-hmm. Um, after three months, we had to double it. And then two months later, we doubled it. Uh, and by the end of the year, we were seven times higher than the original target, which we were told was bonkers at the beginning. 
So you, so your performances way exceeded what was expected of you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness, which is amazing. Uh, and it's it's still going. Mm. It's just running, and we've currently got ten more white bouts under undoing projects now. Mm. Um, but there are people that have come up with four or five different CI ideas. Um, and sometimes it's just like, well, why did we do that? <laughs> and they go, I don't know. Okay, well, surely we can change. Yeah, okay, we've changed that. We've, we've got two machines. Uh, and you might find that one machine doesn't have a problem and another machine does have a problem. But then when we look at it, they're different. Mm. So, well, why can't we just take that and put it on there? Okay, we do that. Oh, fantastic. That worked. It is, it is and, and I know I said this earlier, but it is, it is obviously a lot of common sense. And I can imagine people thinking, well, don't people just normally just do those things if they've got any common sense? No. The, the culture that original was must follow the procedure, must follow the procedure. We're behind, so you can't stop it. Don't stop the machine. Don't stop the machine. Don't stop the lathes because our con our, our our uh, contact lens molds are machined by a, a, a machine so they're mm -hmm. cut and obviously if you stop it you're going to miss out on production mm. but if you're making rubbish or, <laughs> or it's getting lost somewhere else stop it it's all it's already broken yes. it just hasn't you know it hasn't stopped but it's already broken so stop it fix yeah. it find out why but question that that's it just question why why do we do that? Yes, we've always done it, but why? There's I mean, sometimes... you're really reinforcing the whole concept of uh, an awful lot of creating a continuous improvement culture is about changing the mindset of everybody, yeah. leadership, yeah. operators, and so on, to uh, to be thinking in a completely different way and then doing yeah. some enablement through giving them some skills training as well. Yeah such as white belts, as you described. Um, mm. But if you do not do the thinking piece as part of this, the change in the way that we look at the work, then then, then you're never going to get anywhere, are you? No. no. And it's, there's always the continuous improvement is respect people. Yeah. You, you have to respect people. But people are your most powerful tool as well. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. Get people to question what, why, where, and when they do what they do. Mm. But equally, you have to respect, you know, that there are some things that you have to do. That, that you know, we've got certain regulatory and compliance things that, you know, we can't change, and we wouldn't want to change because there are safety net. Mm. But everything else, question it. And you know there are pro there are processes that we we can change, and there are processes that actually, yes, we can change it, but we're probably not going to do it because the amount of work to do that change, and or the cost of the change, and the cost of the the benefit or the cost of the problem, it's no, it's not worth it. Yes, but yeah, if you come to that decision. Go back to the person that came up with the idea mm. and get them to understand that actually brilliant idea, but we can't fix it. You, you know, would you fix it if, and they go, well, no, why would I do that? Yeah. Okay. So, yes. So you're, you're bringing them with you and also yeah. you are doing the thing that, you know, perhaps yeah. originally they, they felt people weren't being listened to and now they feel they are being listened yeah. to. Because and... you're engaging with them, but you're not. They don't feel like pushed back down again because they come up with an idea and you went, no. Mm. You've gone to them and gained their understanding. And you know, once you've got their understanding and, and they're in, you've got their engagement, it, it's like, actually, I, I I know why you didn't do that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And we've, we've, we've worked with those teams now to think in the way that team leaders think and ask questions. And sometimes they come up with ideas and then they don't put them in. And say, well, I can, uh, but I know that my team leader is going to ask me, 
have we got the parts? What's the cost of the parts? What's the payback? How long is it going to take? And you described earlier that the team leaders have been affected by this in that they've had to think differently too about what it means for them to lead, you know, from a sort of yeah. not quite command and control, but yeah. that, you know, close to that. Yeah, we called it Sergeant Major Cooper Vision, not command and control. <laughs> but hey, so yeah, we, we, you know, we took them from the Sergeant Major Cooper Vision to, uh, we called it Boots on the Ground. Right. Um, and it's it's no longer micromanaging, no longer understanding everything that's going on. So if you go to a four-hour meeting, the team leader comes back. They used to get, that's all broken. What do you want me to do about it? They now get, this is what we've done and this is why. Everything's still running because they've, They've created teams that can think for themselves and lead themselves yeah. as if the team leader was still there, even though the team leader isn't there. And off the back of that, 12% of the department have been promoted throughout the company. We've got operators that are now technical operators, mm-hmm. operators that are now team leaders, team leaders are now shift leaders, shift leaders are now managers. We've got technical operators that are now gone to global innovation and technology as engineering technicians. Someone asked me why, because it's the rest of the company's two, three percent. Why is it twelve percent in one of our smallest business units? Well, that's because you've got teams that can think like a team leader. Mm. You've put, you've moved that person so much further down the line that no, they're not a team leader. But they can think like one. Yeah. They know all of the all of the questions that a team leader would question and ask and need answers to before they can make a decision. And they do it every day. So when a team leader's role comes up, it's like, Oh, have you been a team leader? No, but you're obviously, you know, you're a huge fan. You drank the Kool Aid. You had your green belt course, and oh god, yeah. <laughs> and I know you ran home, you all got reorganised your toolbox, and sorted out your shed wall. Yeah. So yeah, there's no stopping you, really, Paul. Is there? No. Um, but what would you say to somebody? So you know, if someone's listening to this and think, okay, I need to get started on this. We really need to take a look at this, and what can we achieve? Hopefully, they're going to feel inspired by your story. Yeah. Where would you tell them to start? And again, but. Okay. Start with the people. I mean, you can you can go in to make something better. And so if I went into production and said, guys, you've done it all wrong. This is how you need to do it. I know better than you. I'm basically saying I know better than them. I have not got a clue what they do. I need, they know it better than anybody else. So listen to them. Understand them. But get them involved in the solution and get them involved with coming up with the solution. And that engagement part, you know, there's always going to be one or two people that don't want to do anything. That's life. But if you impose a solution on someone, then, you know, the natural reaction is, oh, I'm not doing that. But if you get them to come up with a solution, it's like, why would you not want to do it? It's yours. That then becomes easier. You can steer them, you can give them the tools and give them the knowledge, but until you get that buy-in from them, you're going to be imposing stuff on them. And that, yeah, you know, we're all grumpy old men here and and <laughs> ladies, and but <laughs> if you go in to tell someone to do something, oh, I'm, I, they will go out of their way to find a different way to do it. But if you come up with that way that solution with them you go on that journey with them it's like well it was why aren't you doing it it was your you told us that was yeah well i did okay then let's let's just do it but it is it's it's people it's the gemba and it's it's getting them involved yes thank you very much paul it's been um lovely to have some time with you thank you again for yes, cool. being my guest and congratulations to the new Amcube yeah, Vision you on your VQF Excellence in CI Culture Award. Fantastic. I'm thank really you. delighted for you. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of PMI's podcast, Leading for Business Excellence with Paul Hayward from Cooper Vision. If you'd like to know any more 
about how you can develop your career in business excellence and transform your organisation, please drop me a line, team at pmi.co.uk. I'd love to talk to you.